Hi everybody, Ian Bremmer here. Yes, still in the middle of coronavirus, but thought I'd give you a couple of my thoughts on Russia. You know, part of the world that I cut my teeth on as a political scientist way back in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and now uh, Putin is uh, president for life, uh, or at least he gets to be president until 2036. Uh, gets another couple of terms. The constitutional amendments that uh, he reluctantly allowed to be voted on across Russia passed easily, some 76% approval. Um, and so now, both in China and in Russia, uh, term limits get left behind, uh, all for the good of the people, of course, uh, so that they can have the leaders that they truly deserve. Um, uh, yes, I'm being a little sarcastic here. It's sad to see. It's, it's sad to see uh, that the Americans uh, won the Cold War in part, not, not just because uh, we had a stronger economy and a stronger military, but actually because our ideas were better. Um, because when those living in the former Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc looked at the West and looked at the United States, they saw that our liberties, they saw that our economy um, was something that they aspired to and was actually a much better way uh, of, uh, of giving opportunities to the average citizen uh, than their own system afforded. Uh, and that helped them to rise up against it. That's what led to the collapse. That's why the West won the Cold War. And yet now uh, the Russians are now being governed by a leader who has fewer checks on his power internally frankly, than Khrushchev or Brezhnev did in the Soviet days, and who is strongly opposed to the United States, to the transatlantic alliance, and is doing everything he can to try to take advantage of divisions, both inside those societies and across the West in general. Um, first of all, I mean, do I accept uh, that the Russian people actually want Putin? No, not really. Uh, independent uh, election uh, institutions there uh, said that the elections themselves, this referendum was rigged. Uh, it wasn't free and fair. There is, of course, virtually no open media in Russia. The only opposition political parties are those that are allowed by the Kremlin to exist. So it's functionally a one-party state. Uh, also, in a number of uh, regions, you had local authorities that were offering prizes uh, to get people to go and vote. I mean, it, it, the whole thing was kind of a charade. It's interesting that Putin thinks you need to even bother uh, with a vote because, I mean, it's not as if uh, he actually in any way um, is accountable to his people, uh, but he does think that uh, the rubber stamp uh, provides some level of legitimacy. It was like the show trials. Uh, they had the old Soviet days. You know, you wanted to, to pretend that people were getting uh, a trial uh, because it shows uh, that the people um, do indeed um, claim uh, that this is their leader. Um, and, uh, and so you don't have a chance to do anything about it because, of course, yeah, you went out and voted for Putin, didn't you? Didn't you? Um, but I mean, I think the more depressing thing is the fact that uh, the West had opportunities. When the Soviet Union collapsed, you had President Yeltsin and a, a cabinet that really wanted to work with the West and the United States. Um, they were interested in joining NATO. They were interested in a Western free market. And rather than the United States and the West providing the kind of economic benefits that would have allowed them uh, to more functionally stand up their economy, we instead gave them some advice on shock therapy, that they weren't ready for. And so anyone that was attached to power was facilitated in basically stripping clean um, any capital uh, inputs that existed uh, in the country, either taking them out or keeping them for themselves. Um, you also had uh, NATO enlargement that went right up uh, to, uh, to Russia's uh, borders. Um, but, uh, but the NATO-Russia Council that was established to give the Russians an opportunity to see what Russian membership would be like uh, was a, a worthless and weak organization. And there was never any intention of really allowing the Russians in, even the Ukrainians and Georgians given candidate status. 
Um, you had talk of multiple pipelines and integrating the Russian economy. Well, what the Americans really did was Baku Jehan and worked very hard uh, to build pipelines in uh, to the Caucasus, uh, to Central Asia, across the Caspian that would bring that energy to the West and bypass uh, the Russians. You had European Union um, enlargement um, and uh, an unwillingness um, to allow the Ukrainians, for example, um, to be in both uh, the Eurasian Economic Union and to have candidate status um, in the European Union. It was forced to be either one or the other. Um, that was something demanded by Poland, went along by the Germans and the French, and made it an awful lot harder uh, for the Ukrainians to get their economy in order. Uh, all of those things making the Russians feel like the West was interested in um, much more influence in the former Russian sphere of influence, but wasn't really very interested in bringing the Russians along themselves at all. Now, I, I don't think this was done intentionally. I, I don't think the Americans wanted the Russians to be in permanent decline. I don't think they were trying to rub their nose in ignominy and defeat. Rather, I think the Americans didn't care. I think the level of interest in helping to rebuild the Russians was pretty low. Um, this was already a country that had forgotten World War II. Uh, this was not a country that was interested in providing lots of cash for defeated enemies. Instead, it was looking for a peace dividend. That's the way it was discussed under Clinton. You're not fighting the Cold War, that money can go to the United States. And you don't have to think long term about the benefits you might have from having a more integrated global order. Well, either way, I mean, yeah, look, it wasn't just the Americans' fault, of course. Russia was badly governed. Yeltsin turned out to be a drunkard um, who, towards the end, uh, barely showed up uh, to make decisions. Um, a lot of people around him uh, were ineffective, um, and uh, there were uh, lots of claims of corruption. And when Putin shows up uh, to take over, um, and uh, he's seen as somebody who's both like a nationalist and a patriot, but also had worked with Subchak when he was back in, uh, in not pre-Petersburg, Leningrad, um, as a deputy mayor. So maybe he'd do a little bit of both. Everyone came on board and said, hey, he's not the guy that we'd love, but he's good enough. And in fact, back then I even wrote a piece with Boris Nemtsov, who was later assassinated outside the Kremlin just a few years ago, saying, look, Putin's not the guy that we'd love, but given the situation we're in right now, probably the best we can do. But that's, a, that's kind of a sad story. Uh, the pragmatism that's required when you make mistakes and when opportunities aren't taken on and instead they're lost. And here we are um, in, uh, you know, in, in 2020, uh, we have uh, President Trump in the United States. We have an election that also will be claimed to be rigged by an awful lot of people. Uh, we have American institutions that are no longer seen as exemplars for many other democracies around the world not to mention an authoritarian state like Russia, the average Russian citizen may not be happy about Putin for life, but they don't feel like they have anyone else to look to either uh, that would be a better model for them. I mean, yeah, sure, maybe Canada, but it's not exactly uh, big enough and powerful enough to move the needle. So just worth talking about that as we think back to 1991 and Soviet collapse and we look ahead to what's happening just today as Putin is leader forever, uh, see how we got here and uh, a little bit of, uh, you know, why humanity should be doing better. Uh, anyway, that's it for me. I'll talk to you guys all next week. Have a good weekend.